I hope you can hear me uh, for another very interesting event with our dear friend Alita Dirisinga uh, from Leicester University. Today we are going to have uh, uh, this uh, webinar on a pivotal topic that is the use of digital literacy by university students and we are all very much interested in, in the subject and everyone uh, involved, uh, directly involved in it. I just want to uh, make a brief introduction about our uh, Eden NAP, Network of Academics and Professional, who is uh, uh, supporting, uh, of course, in in the framework of, uh, of EDEN uh, the possibility to offer uh, to our membership uh, this kind of uh, um, webinars uh, with so many interesting uh, and relevant contributions by our colleagues that are so kind uh, to offer uh, their, their work to the community. Uh, and uh, what I uh, wanted to, to, to tell you uh, regards, of course, the fact that uh, you can um, be part of this community, taking part of uh, um, what uh, the EDEN Network of Academics and Professionals offers, uh, supporting networking, uh, supporting the possibility to meet other colleagues uh, and start new researchers uh, together. Uh, the um, network of academics and professionals is uh, coordinated by a steering committee that uh, um, I uh, chair. Uh, we try to give a different kind of uh, support. We help members building up a, a personal uh, portfolio. We promote communication, as you know, through uh, this kind of uh, events like the webinars, but also uh, Eden Chat, of course, are uh, part of our offer. Here you can see um, a picture where uh, all the members of the NAP steering committee are uh, shown, so you can match faces to uh, the various names that I think you already uh, know. Uh, the uh, members area where I uh, recommend you to um, enter and uh, log in to meet other uh, colleagues who are part of uh, the community. Uh, here you have a list of uh, um, the opportunities uh, uh, that membership uh, uh, include. Uh, do not forget that uh, uh, being a, a corporate uh, member uh, allow you to um, delegate up to 30 uh, individuals in the NAP, in the Network of Academics and Professionals. So uh, there's the possibility to have conferences, to participate in conferences that reduce fees. Uh, and the most important thing is what I consider the, 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 the really the, the added value of being part of this network is that the possibility to um, meet with, our, with other colleagues to exchange ideas. Uh, about what uh, uh, we mm, do in our uh, institution. Um, the use of social media, the use of channels of communication is uh, central uh, in our uh, uh, activity. Uh, and so uh, please have a, a look at our program. Uh, but mm, first of all, do not miss uh, the possibility to be um, to meet uh, face to face this time at our annual conference that will take place in Bruges uh, in June from the 16th to the 19th of June. 
uh, there we will have uh, the opportunity to have um, uh, speed days meeting organized by our uh, network of academics and professionals where uh, the idea is uh, again to uh, have the opportunity to exchange our uh, views but especially our research interests uh, in order to start uh, new projects uh, uh, together. So I don't want to steal more time to uh, to Palita, uh, uh, and uh, I uh, really I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing what he is going to tell us uh, about digital literacy for university uh, students. Mm, I recommend all the audience to uh, to you know uh, ask questions, uh, participate, interact with Palita. Uh, I really um, thank you all. And Palita, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Palita and I am from University of Leicester. Uh, thank you very much Antonella and uh, um, the whole of um, colleagues from Eden for giving me the opportunity to talk about the research that we are doing. Um, so this is really a great opportunity to, to share um, some of the findings from our research but also a great opportunity to hear from you as well from your perspective. Um, as you have seen from the title slide, you can see that the title is slightly different from what has been advertised. So uh, this is really to, to kind of give a better focus on what we are doing here at Leicester University. Um, if, as Antonella mentioned, um, it will be good if you type your questions as we go along. So um, I can try to take some of those as we go along and then make the session a little bit more interactive as well. Um, about myself, I, I work in Leicester University School of Education. Um, I, I, I lead two uh, master's programs. One is international education, uh, distance learning program, and also learning technologies, a distance learning program as well. And I also teach on a campus-based program, uh, international education, and um, where we have the majority of these students are coming from from other countries other than the UK. In fact, there are some years when we don't have any um, students from uh, UK. Um, uh, this year we have only one student from UK and uh, Wahida in the group is that particular person. So uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why we were interested in carrying out this research project looking at uh, digital literacy skills from a more international uh, perspective. Mm. And in the presentation, what I'm going to talk to you about is the, uh, the kind of data that we have collected from um, students from China. I will um, talk to you a little bit more why particularly um, students from China. Um, so these are my research collaborators, um, Dr. Tracy Simmons from Department of Media, Communication and Sociology, uh, with whom I've been working on this project for uh, about six or seven years. And Dr. Mingji Jiang, also um, work in the School of Education and also um, uh, contributed to this activity as well. And some of the slides I'm going to show you are from her PhD thesis. Um, so in terms of our initial aims, we started the project with um, an idea of looking at um, to investigate international students' access to and the use of um, the kind of digital technologies they use and what you might call Web2 technologies as well. And we wanted to look at uh, how they use these technologies for their both formal and informal learning at the university, uh, but within the context of um, academic learning. Uh, and also, um, the, um, our master's programs are just one year long, just 12 months. 
so we wanted to see how they develop their digital literacy skills during that particular one year period. So uh, as you can probably imagine, one year is a very short period of time um, in terms of academic st uh, studies. Um, so, um, and also um, one of the reasons, another, let me go back to the previous slide. Um, another motivation, uh, more like from a personal point of view, was that um, when we began to teach, when we teach on the program for about few years ago, from, year, from few years ago, uh, we began to notice that students are using um, very strange applications, websites, and in very strange languages as well. So uh, interface is um, tend to be in uh, their own language, uh, Chinese, Arabic, Russian, and you can name uh, many different languages. So um, so when we teach, um, you teach in English and you have your PowerPoint slides in English, but when you see students' computers, they have something completely different. So we wanted to know what's going on and why are they using these kind of tools and for what purpose as well. Um, so this is where I would like you to uh, think about your familiarity or involvement with research projects on students' digital literacy skills. Uh, this can be from um, any level of education, schools or universities or informal education. So um, if you are involved in any kind of a project, uh, if you know a really good projects that we should follow up, um, please type up the on, on the in the chat box. So um, as we as we as we uh, as we continue with the presentation, and um, as I said earlier, if you have any questions, please type them as well. So um, it's useful to start with some definitions of what we mean by digital literacy skills. Um, here again, if you are familiar with any definitions or any uh, any people, authors who are uh, who have come up with really interesting, uh, insightful definitions of digital literacy skills uh, or digital literacy uh, or the sources that we should look for definitions, please type them up as well. Um, what I'm going to show you in next few slides are few um, definitions that I have looked at and some of the challenges with these definitions as well. So to start with, uh, this is one of my favorite definitions of digital literacy skills. Um, uh, this is by somebody called Paul Gilster and in a book he published with the same name, same title in 1997. Um, he um, talked about, I think, I mean, some people say that he's one of the early uh, authors who began to think about digital literacy skills as a specific area of uh, study or investigation. So what he meant, what he said was uh, digital literacy skills or digital literacy means mastering ideas, not keystrokes. So what he meant by that is that um, it is not really the technical skills that we should be looking at. Uh, it's really the ideas behind those uh, keystrokes. Um, I think that's quite a useful quite a simple definition to make a start with. Um, so um, another person that I really, um, I have read quite a lot and I have taken inspirations from was somebody called Buckingham uh, from, from UK. Um, and again, this is slightly an early um, publication in 2006, uh, but it might be worth looking at what he's been writing since then. So what he says about digital literacy skills is that uh, digital literacy skills is much more than a functional matter of learning how to use a computer and keyboard. Again, it's quite similar to the um, definition that we have seen earlier. It's about really ideas. Uh, it's not really about, not necessarily about the technical skills and, and so on. Um, and then he, um, uh, goes on to compare the skills that are needed in the digital stage age 
with that in a print age. What he says with as with print, um, we need to be able to evaluate and use information critically. So we do that with print anyway. So with um, uh, online material, uh, we, we ought to be doing that as well. And also, uh, we ought to be able to ask questions about the sources of that information uh, and interest of its producers and the way it uh, way in which it represents the world. So, um, in a world where we have lots of things like fake news and uh, uh, some people um, uh, using the internet to uh, produce misinformation, this is quite an important thing to think about. And also, um, not only in general media, but this can happen in academic world as well. Um, so, uh, I think that the difference here is that um, in an inf uh, online environment, it, it's quite easy to produce um, this kind of material, whereas in print media, you have um, several people to evaluate your work, peer review, and so on. But in, in online environment, the um, authenticity can be questionable quite often. Um, when we started our research project, we came up with some of the um, conceptual issues or some of the challenges in terms of researching digital literacy skills. Um, I have I highlighted here three of those challenges. Um, one challenge is uh, there seems to be a link between digital literacy skills and academic literacy skills. Um, what I mean by this link is that um, um, we often find students having issues of um, writing. Uh, so that is an academic literacy skills, but that is also connected to digital literacy skills as well. So when you are looking at a particular issue, sometimes it is quite difficult to um, differentiate between whether it's uh, something to do with academic literacy skill or a digital literacy skill. A second challenge is um, the different terminologies that you come across in the literature. Um, so I have just pointed out just four of them. Um, I'm sure you have come across um, notions like information literacy, uh, media literacy, computer literacy, and digital literacy. And then there are many others as well. So my colleague who works in the uh, Department of Media and Communication, um, in their kind of journals and the literature, uh, they quite often tend to use the notion of media literacy. But if you are speaking to somebody from a library, uh, they quite often tend to use the idea of information literacy, which is quite a much older term or the notion or an idea than digital literacy. Then we have the computer literacy and the, I, the, the uh, notion we are discussing today, digital literacy. Um, and then a, a third um, challenge that we have faced was um, that when you are looking at various definitions and frameworks and tools and, and that kind of things on digital literacy or digital literacy skills, um, there are some of those uh, definitions and, and frameworks that are quite simple and that are quite uh, focusing on academic learning. But then there are other definitions and frameworks um, that are that almost cover everything in our life, almost things to do with lifelong learning. Um, so that is one of the challenges, but we wanted to focus on uh, digital literacy skills in the context of academic learning. Um, and um, in the next two or three slides, I'm going to just um, show you links to different um, digital literacy skills models or frameworks. Um, we won't be going into details of those uh, today, but um, once you have had access to the recording, if you click on, if you if you check these links, you can you can uh, follow up on those. So um, in the UK, um, one of the organizations that has been working 
for a very long time on digital literacy skills is uh, JISC. Uh, I'm sure quite a lot of you are familiar with JISC. It's called, it's, um, its long name is Joint Information Systems Committee, and that has been providing funding to carry out research on digital literacy skills. In fact, um, the University of Leicester has just started to use uh, one of their digital literacy frameworks to evaluate students and staff's digital literacy skills um, development. Um, so, as you can see, there is uh, their digital way of looking at digital literacy skills quite broad. There are seven elements to the model. That is, this is another uh, framework that I have found uh, on the web. This is um, a compilation of different digital literacy frameworks. And the third one is this is um, digital literacy uh, policy in national context. This is from Canada. Um, so you might be interested to have a look at this document as well um, in terms of how they interpret digital literacy and skills in a more national context. Uh, so as I was saying, the point I'm trying to make is that um, the, um, uh, the, the, the definition of digital literacy skills as a very simple idea, which is uh, mastering ideas, not keystrokes, uh, that idea has grown into um, something much, much bigger. Um, so I think uh, as researchers, I think we kind of need to uh, think about how we might research digital literacy skills. Um, one of the ones, as I said, I really like is uh, Buckingham's way of uh, talking about digital literacy skills. Um, it's old, but I think it, it works. Um, he identifies four dimensions of digital literacy skills. Uh, representation, language, production, and audience. So um, here he talks about criticality on authority of um, the information and who produced the information and the grammar of producing information. This is where some of the technical skills um, are coming into play. And the production and the audience um, and who we are in terms of uh, the consumer of digital information. Um, so at the end of these slides, there is a list of uh, references, so it might, it might be worth following up on those as well. Um, so this is the framework we have used in our research in terms of trying to get students to talk about their digital literacy skills. Um, now focusing on China, uh, focusing on Chinese students. Uh, this is, as I said, um, uh, mainly partly because uh, the majority of students on our courses are coming from mainland China. Um, UK universities rely quite a lot on um, uh, Chinese students, uh, students coming from China. Um, so um, one of the um, one of the um, reasons, academic reasons for focusing on international students is that what we found when we look at previous research is that there is a limited focus on the diversity of student population in universities, especially um, trying to collect data from students coming from into other countries to UK, um, and also uh, students on postgraduate courses as well, and also students who are trying to develop their digital literacy skills within a one year period, which is a very short period of time. Just the context of um, behind our research, um yeah i've got um five points here um why it is important to focus on this particular group um their contribution to uk economy is very high um and um, their numbers are quite high as well um and the majority of uh, postgraduate students uh, are, are from china um, and then they will continue to be the largest source of in income for, for international postgraduates um, in the years to come as well. Uh, and also more locally, uh, uh, when you think about a university like Leicester, not only Leicester, we have another university in, the, in our town um, and also few universities in our region and um, quite a few, well, in the UK overall. Um, but, um, uh, 
the major, a lot of students are coming from China for 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 those courses. So it's 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 an important group to focus on. Um, we uh, the very first year when we started to collect data, first couple of years, we used a questionnaire to collect data from students. Um, and then we use focus groups, the middle one, that means uh, group interviews, uh, three or four students in, a, in each group, um, uh, but only two or four focus groups a year. And then we did the focus group workshop with students as well, more like a one day workshop, uh, trying to get students to um, show us what they can do with digital um, skills. But later on, we dropped the questionnaire and we dropped the focus groups. But we continued to um, we continued to uh, collect data using um, uh, focus groups. Um, just give me a second. Yeah. Um, so what we did in the um, focus group interviews was that uh, we have asked the students to tell us uh, the scenarios of uh, how they go about doing a piece of assessment like an essay and then um, how they use digital resources and then how they are going to evaluate the authenticity of information. So that is more like the first question and then we continue we, we, we had some probing questions as well so this is the um, the general question template that we have used so we have asked them to think about a particular um, learning and study related activity uh, the easiest one um, for them to think about was a piece of assessment and we asked them how they do it where they make a start and what kind of resources they use and then they will begin to talk about the digital technologies uh, resources uh, they have used. So we, then we began to ask more and more questions. Um, but later on, I will show you the shift of the focus later on. Um, so you will have access to this. So I'm going, not going to show you this, keep, keep this on the screen anymore. But you got the general idea. So we ask him to tell us about how they are going to do, how they are doing a particular piece of assessment and the use of technology. Um, but um, after two or three years, um, our shift, uh, we, uh, our, our focus shifted a little bit uh, because um, we thought that unless we asked them to tell us a little bit about their previous academic background, and also the issues that they face in things like writing uh, academic essays um, it doesn't really give us um, much uh, data or incomplete uh, picture so we were more or less um, looking at academic literacy skills as well so this is where I was I mentioned earlier that there is a there is a link more or less between the academic literacy skills and digital literacy skills and then we also asked them uh, questions about um, the transition issues and the culture because we we were interested they began to tell us about how different it is learning in the uk compared with china and uh, the kind of issues that they are facing as a as a student in the uk so um so we that's when we began to think about the cultural issues as well and also bearing in mind that uh, the majority of these students almost 900 percent of these this is a particular kind of generation where they are the only child in their family. So um, there is that um, particular aspect as well um, in terms of adjusting to uh, studies in the UK. Um, so research aims more recent. These are the kind of research aims. So we were looking at the last one is the digital literacy skills, but we also were looking at transition from learning from one cultural setting to learning in another. Um, and the, how the culture influences learning. So we were looking at culturally sensitive pedagogies 
Um, and then we, we were interested or we were aware that they were coming from a more what you might call a Confucian values oriented culture, uh, the way they were grown up and in, the, in, in their universities how they learned and in families how they grew up as well. And then um, how the uh, digital resources helped them uh, to help their transition process within one year. As you can see, it's kind of um, became um, slightly expanded. So some of the concepts that we have uh, struggling to understand and try to use to explain our data were Confucian heritage of learning. Um, so this is a major influence in teaching and learning in East Asian countries, not only in China, but also Japan and Korea and uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, most of those countries. But there are misconceptions about the, this particular way of learning as well. For, for example, there is a misconception that uh, the students coming from those countries just focus on memori memorizing, but that is not really the case. Um, so uh, these are our results. Um, so the basic idea was that um, we wanted to, um, we wanted not to forget that um, we need to look into their culture as well. Um, so uh, a very short ex extract from a transcript. So they were talking about the difference between how they learn or the learning arrangement or the classroom environment when they were uh, doing their undergraduate degree. So this is very much uh, a difficult situation for them to adjust when students come to UK to study. So um, so this is where quite a lot of the time uh, they, they find the technologies um, being useful. Um, so we found in classrooms students are using a lot of uh, mobile phones, a lot of apps. I'm sure they are doing various personal things as well, but they tend to be doing quite useful things as well in order to be able to engage in their learning. Um, um, and then the second um, extract here um, focuses on the sort of assignments they have to do. They need to write 4,000 word essays, four of those, and another long dissertation, 20,000 words. So by the end of the year, they have to be, they're writing quite a lot in English. And that's the first time they do that as well. Um, and then there is a focus on understanding, which is probably different from what they've been doing before. So this is where we thought that there are a lot of transition issues in terms of getting used to the new learning culture. And they try to deploy a lot of different kind of technologies. And um, we have seen um, uh, apps for almost everything. Um, and then uh, this extract shows, uh, talks about in this extract, and they were talking about the discussions that they need to be engaged in. Initially, they find it quite hard, but later on, they get used to it. So this is a bullet uh, slide showing um, the differences between the two contexts. Um, so there is a difference between the types of teaching and learning sessions um, and um, types of assignments, um, academic writing conventions, um, uh, the particular behavior in teaching sessions, all of those, most of these are quite new to this particular group of students. Um, so, um, so here again, this student is talking about um, the teachers are um, uh, guiding students rather than actually teaching much. Um, so that's a different way of learning. So this is where some of those technologies can become quite useful for students. Um, so I'm going to skip some of these slides because you will have access to them later on. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit conscious about the time. So um, I hope you can see this. So this is the kind of technologies students were using, web tools and applications that they, we found they are using uh, for their formal learning. So if you have a, a mobile phone, sorry, I'm sure you have, um, uh, take a photograph of this 
slide because I would like you to compare this with a slide I'm going to show you later on. I should have put these two slides um, side by side. But if you take a photograph of this, um, then you can compare it with something I'm going to show you later on. Yeah. Um, so um, this is um, uh, the kind of things on the left hand side, I think, yes, on your, on your screen, on the left hand side, um, the web tools and applications students use users are you were using in China for uh, and then on the right are the kind of web tools and applications they um, they use in the UK so you can see that in the China no Google uh, well no Blackboard and no Wikipedia so these are all black banned in China well Blackboard is accessible if, if, the, if the universities use them but uh, there are several applications that are not accessible in China. So you, then these students begin to use them. It's, an, it's a kind of a different kind of transition. But you can also see that they continue to use some of these applications in the UK as well for their formal learning to help them their transition. Um, and then this next slide shows uh, the, the tools that students use for communication. Um, in China, the major one is WeChat. I'm just wondering whether you are familiar with um, with 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 an application and tool called WeChat. Um, well, if you if you have any students in China from China, um, and then if you or if you are working with um, someone with in China, then without WeChat, you will not you won't be able to get much further. Um, so our students use WeChat, so we have to use WeChat as well. Um, so it's a major communication tool and it's a major tool that they use for in China to pay for uh, goods and services and almost everything. Um, so um, it, it is one of the examples of a web tool that shows um, the Chinese cultural values. Um, um, okay, so so you can see they begin to use Facebook, they begin to some of the use things like WhatsApp. Um, and line and Twitter and Skype but um, but that is after they come to UK um, so um, the next one so this is the um, online resources and tools the students use for their academic learning but if you can compare this with the other uh, image I showed you where I have asked you to take a photograph and um, so you can see that it's a completely a mirror image of um, what you have seen before. So um, um, the um, things like YouTube are not available in China, but instead, instead um, they have something called Yuku, which you can see in, in the photograph you have taken. And same with others as well. So we can, instead of Wikipedia, they would have something else. Instead of, um, I don't know, Twitter, they have something else and so on. So there is a big transition students to um, move from um, when they come to come to UK in, ter in terms of study. So when we, if we put um, learning material on YouTube, on um, Twitter, um, on other sites, um, then um, they will have a difficulty um, for most of them it will be the first time to hear about these tools um, okay um, so students in these slides talk about uh, the different kind of resources they use in China as well a lot of the things are quite centralized so this particular site CNKI is a centralized national knowledge infrastructure a portal where you can access the um, scientific articles. Um, it's a very centralized and controlled centrally. Uh, that's another thing about material and uh, resources in China they, that they have used to um, gain access to. Um, some of the um, preliminary conclusions from a study were that um, so they are they they show us a huge array of online resources. Um, and some, um, and then familiar, they bring those tools and resources and experiences with them 
when they come to study in the UK. So the implication is that I think as academics we need to be aware of this. Um, and they are not, it is not that they don't um, get used to the tools and resources available in the UK. So they talk about things like TED Talk and other resources. So they, uh, they also get used to the resources that they have, but they need a little bit of time. Um, um, so this is the third point is an important one. Whenever they face limitations in resources, they draw on sources from China, book review sites, translation tools, and so on. So there are certain apps they use in classrooms to um, translate um, words. Uh, so you just uh, point the uh, whatever the, the mobile phone into a word and then it will translate. And then there are some tools that translates whole um, PDF files into Chinese. And the translation is um, quite accurate as well. Um, and yes, so they, they do face some issues in transition and this is partly the cultural issues as well. Um, and then things to do with academic, new academic working context, writing essays, uh, acknowledging sources, referencing. This is where the academic writing skills issue comes into uh, the foreground. Um, and then I think it is important to <clears throat> be aware, acknowledge the cultural issues as well, um, and then how we might help their transition smoothly into the uh, more Western type of teaching and learning uh, context. Um, but we also need to be a little bit aware of how we use these terms and there can be misinterpretation, misinterpretations as well. So I'm going to show you this particular idea called cultural script. So the, this is a useful uh, notion to look at uh, the transition issues and um, how uh, students begin to use new digital resources and tools. Um, what, what it means is that um, the students, whoever, um, any person who grows up in a particular culture, bring the, some of the cultural elements into um, their, their work, their new life, um, but they also um, tend to ad adapt to the new situation as well. So if anyone is interested in um, the idea of cultural script, the, this particular um, authors are quite useful to read. Um, so for us, um, for universities, we should be more aware of the kind of digital tools and resources students are familiar with, um, and then um, to, to work with those tools and resources, and then uh, to, to help their formal and informal learning. And we need to acknowledge those as well. Um, and then we need to uh, be aware of how we might provide um, support in terms of students developing digital literacy skills. So I, I, I don't think it's really um, a useful thing to um, develop our frameworks just based on our own conceptions and what we use in the West. We need to look at what kind of tools students are bringing with them from their own cultures as well. Um, so this is a list of selected references. Um, so the top one, uh, Francis 2010, um, this is actually a book based on a PhD thesis um, submitted to University of Oxford. That's one of the early studies that looked into students' use of digital tools and resources um, in formal learning in university context. So that's really a useful book to look at. And then the other one will be um, the last one to look at the cultural script. Um, I think that's, yes, okay. So um, we are in future, um, so we, we collect data almost every year. Um, our plan is to conduct individual interviews with the same student during the course of their postgraduate study period. And also we are thinking about using other data collection methods as well. 
uh, we did do a large a large scale um, survey but um, <clears throat> we didn't continue to do that but i think we have enough data to develop a survey tool to collect data from um, large cohort of students and for that we have we, we, we are interested in working with more partners more colleagues so um, at the moment we are just beginning to work with colleagues from university of sheffield and uh, liverpool and uh, john moore's university as well so if you are interested um, please drop me a line um, i think my email address is at the beginning of the presentation so thank you very much for taking part um, Okay, so yeah, so let's take some questions. So Francesca, thank you very much for the question. I'll, I'll take from Francesca's question. So the question is, um, uh, we need, do we need to adopt different educational approaches to develop students digitally literacy from different cultural background? Um, yes, I think so. I think, I mean, it might not be different, completely different educational approaches, but I think we need to um, perhaps um, do something like an audit of the type of um, digital tools and uh, skills students bring in, um, and then we can probably adopt our way of um, helping them to learn digital literacy skills uh, bearing in mind that especially students from china for example when they go back they won't have access to facebook um, if you are a, a facebook friend of a chinese student and if you still um, um, just keep facebook you will never hear from them again so we need to think about the kind of tools they use as well in fact i'm, I'm sure wahida will agree with me um, i'm sure our students on her course the first thing they do is they get you to open a WeChat account and then uh, everyone is happy. <laughs> um, Maria Rosarcia, thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much for all your help before as well. And um, question is, what do you think about the connection between critical thinking development and digital literacy? I think they are very much connected. Um, there is a strong connection between critical thinking development and digital literacy because digital literacy uh, skills is a critical, um, uh, has a, a quite a strong critical component as well. Um, so that's where the uh, idea of um, mastering ideas uh, comes before the um, mastering technical skills. So there is a strong uh, connection between the two. Thank you very much for the question, Maria. Uh, yes, okay, so um, so if um, I can take a few more questions. Wahid, I, I don't know any, there are any other questions from, from colleagues. Um, um, I'm, I, I could have shown you a little bit more because unfortunately or fortunately I just moved to a new office so this uh, my books and everything is everywhere at the moment so um, the only bit of the office that is tidy is what you can see at the back if I turn my camera around you will see a uh, uh, untidy office uh, where I can't find any books at the moment any of my books and um, <laughs> Um, another thing I just uh, wanted to mention was that um, some of the methodological changes we did was um, initially our idea was to quite in the early stages our focus groups were quite big we were we had about five or six students in a focus group but um, what we found was that um, that was not very useful to collect data because um, when you have five or six students this particular cultural group means that there is always one or two students who will be quite silent if you like so now um, our focus groups are quite small either two or three but now i think an um, even better approach will be to collect data from um, just a, a single one student so we can get them to talk um, and another thing we have done based on our research was that uh, we have changed our uh, approach to doing 
the initial induction period and um, now we have a different way of providing an induction to students where our students try to share their experience of learning uh, as undergraduates with everybody and giving uh, more time to socialize socialize with um, with other students in order for especially for for the majority of participants to be able to share, uh, be familiar with, with sharing ideas. Um, okay, so I think um, it looks like um, we, okay, sorry, um, Muna Ali, so your question was the, um, cultural script con concept and miss the reference I put up. So let me let me take the presentation back. So the, the main reference I recommend you to read, this is actually, you can download from, from the internet. Uh, it's available as a free book. Um, the last one uh, in this list. Um, it's a long name, Belly Color, T and Watkins, C, 2008 improving intercultural learning experiences in higher education responding to cultural scripts for learning in fact um, what they have done in their research they, 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 these two authors are, are from university of london in the uk um, so they have actually interviewed students from um, many different uh, international backgrounds so uh, not only china but uh, students from india and uh, and other countries uh, middle east countries and so on so it's really a useful uh, useful book to um, uh, download and read um, Yeah, so uh, the idea of cultural script is that we, the way we do things, um, we behave, we talk, we, um, our behavior is um, based on the culture in which we grew up. Um, so we always bring that kind of script with us whenever, wherever we go into a new cultural context. But it doesn't mean that we are, uh, we are not fixed and we can change as well but uh, initially i think it's important to understand the why people do things in a different way so we can understand each other better and um, so we have um, now uh, 27 minutes past four in the afternoon uh, in your time so and um, I think the the um, plan was to do this webinar for one hour. So um, perhaps we can, yeah, okay. So we can we can stop here. And thank you very much for your active participation. And I really enjoyed talking to you about this. And uh, thank you very much again, Antonella and um, all the colleagues in the Eden Secretariat. Thank you very much. Um, so. <laughs> so um yeah so um i hope to meet you um at something similar okay all right okay so we have the next eden say okay thank you very much i'm going to switch off my microphone and the um and the webcam. Good to see you. Thank you. Good afternoon.